Good evening, good evening to my YouTube viewers, Facebook family, and friends. We are back again with another week of a hot topic. Is Creflo Dollar wrong? Ties and offering. Let's talk about it in context. Listen, if you're coming on, you know what to do. Hit the like, love, share button, amen. Share this with somebody that they can be blessed as well. I'll give it a few moments for the numbers to come on, amen. And give me just a second here. All right. All right. Let me know in the comments if you all are on. Amen. Praise the Lord. Minister Elijah Lampkin. Amen. My sister Kiana is online. Listen, don't worry about that screaming in the back. All right. That's my children. My wife is getting ready to uh, get some dinner for them. So you may hear a little a little noise in the back, but hopefully not too much. All right. But we going forth anyway. I'm excited. Sister Skylar's on the line tonight. Thank you for coming on and being a faithful viewer, all right? And y'all know what I like to do. I like to pray in. Let me know if you can hear me clearly, if you can see me clearly, all right? Give me a thumbs up. Shoot me a thumbs up because I need to make sure that what's coming out is heard clearly and correctly tonight. Let me tag a few people in this. As I ask you all to share it, let me make sure that I'm sharing this with a few people. Is that all right? All right. Let me let me send this to uh, a few people. All right. All right. And let me tag my sister in here. A few people. All right. We're going to have some fun tonight. Is that cool? Thank you. Thank you for tagging the people. Amen. Listen, we got a lot to cover tonight. And uh, I want to make sure that this stuff is heard correctly. Let me send this to one more person. Bam. Thank you for the thumbs up. We are sharing. We are going live tonight. Amen. Let me know if the lighting is okay. Let me pray in. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Yahshua, we call upon you this evening, just thanking you again for another night, another day, for being who you are. Lord, we understand that many did not wake up today, but we are grateful that we are alive and well and clothed in our right mind. We thank you for life. We thank you for provision. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for peace in the midst of our troubles. Lord, we thank you for our spouses and our children. We thank you for employment. We thank you for the activity of our lambs, oh God. We are grateful, God, and we can't even praise you enough. But what little we can do, we want to say thank you. And as we come before you, I ask for forgiveness, God, for all of our sins that you forgive us as we come to you with a heart of repentance. I pray, God, tonight that as I decrease, that you increase your knowledge, your wisdom, not according to how I feel or what I think, but according to the context of your word. I pray that you alone may be glorified tonight and that people will come with their questions and look that leave with their answers according to what you have poured out tonight. And so, Lord, we thank you. I pray for those who are sick, shut in, who are incarcerated, those who have lost loved ones, oh God. I pray that you bring peace, restoration, and order. And these things I pray, God, that we get clarity on your word tonight concerning on how to move forward in worshiping you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Listen, thank you all for coming on. I see Brother Jones. I see another person that just has Facebook, Facebook user. I can't see all the names, amen. But uh, I'm going to do my best to interact back and forth with you tonight amen uh let's 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 have, listen my brother Rook, let me put this up he said let's let's have this tithing thing off we're gonna deal with it tonight amen and as i said on this channel we are going to deal with the tough and hard topics 
Now, let me say this. Starting out the gate, the title is, is Creflo Dollar Wrong? Ties and Orphan, Let's Talk. Well, I want to make it plain that I am not a supporter or an endorser of Creflo Dollar and his church. I'm not. I do not follow him. However, I am familiar and aware of his teachings over the years. Amen. And I won't go so far as to call out his character. I'm not here for that. But I will say that he has taught some things that have been biblically correct. But he's taught quite a few things that has been false doctrine, which is why over the latter years, he has been retracting his statement on the issue of tithes and offering. This is what we're going to deal with here tonight, because his video that he put out has caused an uproar in the churches. People are mad. People are confused and they have questions about tithes and offering. So I pose the question tonight, was Creflo Dollar wrong? Listen, you can type this in on YouTube when you get time to type in Creflo Dollar tithes and offering 2022. And it'll pop up on the flyer that you have seen on Facebook or YouTube. When I get done, I'm going to edit and post his picture. You'll see the background of him in a bluish or purplish background. And he was teaching. And he even went so far to say as every book that you have ever bought from him and every video that you have purchased, according to tithes and offering, he says, throw it out unless it lines up with what he is teaching today. Now, out of his own mouth, he said this on the video, all right? And so I want you all, when you get a chance, I'm not endorsing him, but for the sake of understanding, I want you to take a look at it when you get time to see what he was talking about. And so now let's go. Brother Zoe is on the line. Thank you, uh, Candace Hosea. We're gonna deal with the tithes and offering. So here it is. Is Creflo Dollar wrong? Hmm, inquiring minds want to know. It's spicy. Or is ties for today, preacher? What do you say? What do you think about it? Well, I also want to address this going into this video tonight. Please leave your feelings, leave your age, and leave your ranking out of it. Listen, no disrespect. I don't care how you feel about it. I don't care your age or how long you have or have not been doing this. And I don't care about the ranking. Neither does God because he gives out the ranking. We are only concerned about the context of the biblical doctrine of what God said according to his word. Because in Psalms 138 verse 2, he says that he has magnified his word above his own name. And so we are only interested in what the scriptures says. Amen. Well, preacher, you say, what is a tithe? Let's first deal with that before I answer the question. A tithe is simply a tenth. It's a tenth of what you have cultivated and produced so far as in the land. And clearly, we're going to look in scripture on where this was talking about in Old Testament. This is different from the first fruits. Some preachers will try to equate first fruits with tithes, but they're different. And if I can read something for a minute, all right, give me a second. Let me read this. The main difference between a tithe and a first fruit is that the tithe, as I said a moment ago, is a 10% tax levied on people by the church, right? That's a tenth. But the first fruits are a celebration where a person offers their first harvest to God. So they're two different things. Let me go a little deeper now. Tithes was before the law and got implemented in the law as the law was being produced in the books of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, even coming out of Exodus. We start getting into the laws now, the Mosaic laws. 613, 248 thou shells, and 365 thou shall not. All right? So a tithe is simply a tithe. Now, let me answer the question. Is Creflo Dollar wrong? 
But when you watch the whole video, you'll understand my reason and what I'm about to say. Yes and no. Here we go. Creflo allegedly has said that ties was not biblical. He's wrong. And I'm about to prove it with scripture because ties was a biblical concept in the Old Testament. However, he is right on the context of what he taught about tithes today. So, preacher, do we tithe today? Is it mandatory to tithe? Absolutely not. Uh-oh. I hear the wheels turning. I hear the chariots and the horses coming to get me now. Uh-oh. What do you mean, preacher? Because we tithe. Well, let's see what a tithe is. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 14. Can we go to it? Can we go to it for the people's sake? For the people's sake? <laughs> you got me singing over here tonight. Let's go to Deuteronomy 14. And I want to add to you that ties, uh-oh, here goes a big one. Somebody give me a drum roll. Ties was not money. Uh-oh, we in trouble now. Listen, I'm going to be taking pauses throughout this video because I want you to let it marinate in your spirit. Let it digest in your mind and in your heart. I know it's it's hard. It's going to be hard for some to receive this. Amen. Because you're probably not used to hearing this. But I'm going to speak strict, strictly from what the scripture says. Again, let's leave out feelings, age, and rank. Leave your emotions out. Let's talk Bible. Let's talk chapter, verse, and content. No, not your interpretation, not my interpretation, because that doesn't matter. We're talking about the exegesis of the word, straight context of what God was saying when he wrote it through his prophets. Okay, let's get to it. Deuteronomy chapter 14. I'm, I'm going to open the book. You see the book? It's nice pages, everyone. I feel like Mr. Rogers, when you flip through the pages, huh? it's a good book here and you flip through the pages and you want to read. I got my book. All right. And my book is a it's a Hebrew and Greek book. OK, for those who want to study in the Hebrew and the Greek, I'm getting it out of here. OK, let's go to Deuteronomy 14. Let's see what it says here. Okay. Can I look at it? Ah, tithing, tithing. Here it is. The tenth, the tenth of the tithe to fifth and all the tees. <laughs> verse 22 let's read it it says thou shalt truly tithe all in the increase of thy seed uh oh here we go that the field bringeth forth year by year now obviously God is giving this to the children of Israel all right here it is verse 23 and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn. Uh-oh, wait a minute. I got to put this in the comment because I think I'm moving too fast. Let me, let me, let me put this in the comments. Let me, let me put this. Can I put this here? You got to give me time, people. Let me see. And thou should in the place where his name, uh-oh, here it is. Let me copy and paste this right here so I can pull it up for you guys, okay? Because so I want you to see this. Here it is. Paste it here, okay? I want you to see I'm not making this up. All right. So let's see if this, this look at this. It says, can you see it on the screen? It says, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of the corn, of the wine, of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and thy flocks, that you may as learn to fear the Lord. Wait a minute. Preacher, you just said earlier that tithes was not money. It's not. I'm showing you in the scripture here. It's right here. It says, of thy wine and thy corn. Well, you say, preacher, that was their money. No, it was not. And I'm going to prove it in a minute. Let me go a little bit deeper. I'm, I'm going to read this next few verses. Verse 24 says, 
Let me finish this. And the first needs of thy herds, of thy flocks, that you must learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Okay. And then it says this. Let's talk about it. Verse 24, it says, and if the way be too long for thee, check here is key because a lot of pastors and preachers miss this. They said, is if it be too long, if your travel is too long, right? And if it be the place too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God had blessed you, verse 25. Uh oh, I got I gotta I gotta share this with y'all. So let me take my time because I don't want to rush this. I want to pull it up on the screen. Can I pull it up on the screen, please? How you doing? Let me pull up on the screen. Here it is. Bam. And you about to see this. There it is. All right. I'm working hard over here, y'all. Here it is. Let's read this together. Verse 25 says, then shall you, thou is you, turn it into money. Wait a minute. Stop right there, preacher. What are you saying? I thought their harvest and the corn was their money. No, clearly not. Because look at the scripture. It says in verse 24, we just read that if the travel be too far for you, then and only then shall you turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and you shall go into the place which Lord thy God shall choose. Uh oh. And then verse 26, I'll put this up in a minute. It says, and you shall be stored the money for whatsoever your soul lusted, lusted after. Uh oh. Let me, I got to post that because I want to show you. I'm, po I'm posting this. I want to show you that that ties was not money. Here it is. Let me go to this one. Then you shall be stored the money. Remember, we just read in verse 25, turn the tithe into money. The tithe was not money. But when you could not make the uh, destination, then you turn the tithe into money. And it says, for whatsoever your soul lusted after for the oxen. Now it's going back into the tithe. For the oxen, the sheep, the wine, the strong drink, and whatsoever your soul desireth. And you should eat before the Lord thy God, and you shall rejoice. Uh-oh, verse 26, it says, and thy household. So what do we see here? We're seeing that the tithe was wheat, cattle, sheep, corn. And then if you could not make the trip that the Lord God had told you to, it said then turn it into money. You have the tithe and you have the money. This is tithe, this is money. Well, preacher, are you saying tithing is not today? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Because here's why. As I mentioned earlier, tithes was before the law. Well, what about Abraham, preacher? Didn't Abraham pay tithes to Melchizedek? Mm -mm. We got to read that again. Somebody put in Genesis chapter 14, verse 20. Can we do that? Let's go to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. We're going to see. What Abraham did. Genesis chapter 14. Let, matter of fact, let me change it to the NLT, okay? This title in verse 17 is called Melchizedek blesses Abraham, okay? Genesis 14, and it reads this. After Abraham returned from his victory over Kedilomoro, however you say that name, I just jacked it up, okay? <laughs> Sound it out. Kedilor Lamor. However you say it, you know his name. It starts with a K and it says all his allies, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him in the valley. OK, verse 18, it says it says and Melchizedek, the king of Salem and the priest of God, the most high brought Abraham some bread and wine. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham with the blessing, this blessing. It said, <laughs> Blessed be Abraham by God, the most high, the creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God, the most high, who has defeated your enemies. Then Abraham. Listen, listen, this is key. Then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all his goods he had recovered. This is after Melchizedek had went to the war. And so Abraham had gave him a tenth of the spoils that he won from the war. Okay, 
Thank you for putting that in the comments, brother. Let me let me uh, post that so the people can read it. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom with a raised hand, I have sworn an oath unto the Lord. Now notice God did not command Abraham to give a tenth. It said Abraham gave a tenth. He took it upon his own admission to give Melchizedek a tenth of what he had won from the war. And why? It reads here. It says, but Abraham said unto the king of Sodom, raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal. That's right, brothers. Oh, it was Abraham's choice. It wasn't God. And why did he say that? He said he wouldn't accept a thread from him. And why is that? Well, verse 24, he said, I will accept only what my young warriors have already eaten. And I request that you give a fair share of the goods to my allies. Mm. Why, 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 why? Because Abraham did not want Melchizedek to take the credit for how God had blessed him. Abraham was already a blessed man because God had promised him through the promised son of him and Sarah, right? Isaac. And he had Ishmael with Hagar, right? His handmaid. But he had already promised that he would make his descendants as numerous as the stars. And so God had already blessed Abraham. So Abraham took it upon himself, not commanded by God. And it was a one-time isolated event. It didn't say tithe. It said a tithe, H-E. Tithes. H-E-S is plural, which means more than one. But Abraham only tithed one time. This is brought up in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 7, if you want to run reference. And why did he do that? Well, thank you, brother. He just put it on there because he did not want to be indebted or in bondage to King Melchizedek, which means a righteous king, king of justice. That's what the name of Melchizedek meant. It means king of justice. And it will tell you that in Hebrews chapter 7 which makes reference of Abraham paying a tithe one time. So we cannot take a one isolated event, right? And make a doctrine out of it. And do you know the things that you win from a war? Well, let's look at it. You want, you want armor? You want some chariots, some horses, probably some fruits, some produce, maybe a couple of coins and stash that they had on them. You want some weapons? That had nothing to do, amen, with money. It was the spoil of the war, the things that they took to battle that Abraham had gave unto Melchizedek. I'm just showing you the Bible in context. That's not enough for you. Okay, let's go to Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. We're going from Old Testament to New Testament, okay? Now, I know some are going to look at this video and some may disagree. Some may call me a charlatan. Some may say I'm a hypocrite. Some may say I'm a Pharisee. Some may say I'm preaching false doctrine. But when you look at the context of what I'm saying, I'm teaching nothing but biblical texts. Here it is. Leviticus 27 verse 30. Let's get to it. It says this. Here it is. Again, this is dealing with tithes and offering. Tithes and offering. I'm going to hit the hot note for you. It says this, one-tenth of the produce, mm, tithes, as I said, was not money. It was food and animals. This was the tithe. It says this, one-tenth of the produce of the land, where the grain from the fields or the fruit of the trees belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. This is why we cannot teach that tithes and offering is money because if you know, tithes was mentioned about 30 to 32 times in the book of Genesis. Uh-oh. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. It was mentioned 30 to 32 times in the book of Genesis. Why? Well, you had people that made fine linen. They made garments, clothing. You had people that did agriculture. You had people that were blacksmiths that specialized in weapons. Oh, my God. Listen. Then in Genesis chapter 40, verse 2, somebody put this in the comments. You remember when Joseph 
was thrown in jail, right? And he gave the dream to the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh was wroth against his two officers. This was a profession. These are professions that people made their money. And it says this, against the chief butlers, that was a profession, and against the chief bakers so you had tailors in the old testament you had bakers in the in the old testament that made money off their talents and gifts so money was mentioned plenty of times money the concept of money is mentioned over two thousand times in the bible but i'm saying this for the sake of context that in the old testament we cannot say that tithes and offering was money because they had different professions in the Old Testament where they made money. This is why I put up Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 25. This says, when you don't have enough uh, to travel to get to the destination, then take the tithe and go turn it into money that lets you know that it was never money. So where did this come from, preacher? I'm glad you asked because I got a few more things that I want to deal with. Did you know that the church in history, look this up, the church supported itself for a total of 300 years off of offerings not tithes offerings do you know how the tie got translated into money mm. look it up a guy by the name of edmund who was from europe in the sixth century right produced the institution of ties converting to money well this is a fact and when you look at the 1800s from 1830 ish to 1833 this concept got pushed in by the roman bishops the roman catholics the priests this is online listen you can fact check me right now money was not an issue right until the religious leaders from the Catholic Church had brought this false doctrine into the church. And it was to produce extortion on the church, to get money and taxes. That's what it was for. Oh, so what do we do? Well, we say Malachi chapter three. We say, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me in tithes and offerings and you are cursed with the curse uh-oh that's right false doctrine we use malachi chapter three but how is it that you're going to start in the middle of a movie to understand the whole movie why do we start in malachi chapter three and we didn't go to chapter one if you go to the beginning of the book it will explain to you that this was giving to the Levites. Malachi chapter three. And he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Uh oh, here's another problem. We say that the church is the storehouse and it is not. The church is a place where we worship and learn doctrine from the Lord according to his word. The storehouse is a place of the things that I mentioned in Deuteronomy, wheat, barley honey produce of the land this was a storehouse when they ran out of room of the churches where they couldn't keep it so the church is separate from the storehouse we try to equate it the same but when you look at the history it's not the same the church is not the storehouse and the pastors today are not the leviticus priesthood don't you understand that you are a gentile that has been adopted into the royal family because you understand that the Old Testament was not written to the Gentiles. It was written to the Jews. Uh-oh. The law was given by Moses. And it was to the culture of Israel. It had nothing to do with you or me. Nothing. The law of Moses, the 613 had everything to do with the children of Israel, not you and not me. And so when you look at Malachi chapter one, don't start at chapter three because you're skipping. You're missing the context. Chapter one will tell you is dealing with Israel. 
Now it's going to get into dealing with the Levites. And he said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Somebody put that in the comments. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. I, I'm, I'm going to go to it now because somebody mad at me. So, somebody saying I'm preaching heresy. All right. But I'm, I'm going to give you what the Bible said. Let's go to Malachi. Don't worry about the noise in the back. Oh, I might get stoned after this. I might get stoned, 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 stoned after this. Here we go. Listen, it's dealing with Israel. Even in chapter two, it says Israel is unfaithful. Now, when we go to Malachi chapter three, because y'all got me singing tonight. It says, verse eight, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. I'm in the Bible, y'all. I'm not giving you opinion. I'm not giving you what churches have said. I'm not giving you what the pastor said. I'm giving you the book, okay? The book right here says, but you say we're in heaven robbed thee and tithes and offering. Remember I said tithes was not money. It was, it, was, it was produce and animals of the land. It was a taxation. Do you know that of us today is when they take out taxes on our job? We gross and then we get the net worth. They take about 20%. That's our taxation. The taxation of Israel was produce of the land, besides the money that they were already, already making. Okay. Verse 9, it says, you are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me with it, because the inheritance of the Israelites was given to the Levites, because they had no inheritance. You read this all through the Old Testament. So it was Israel's job to take care of the Levites who dedicated their lives into the temple. This is a fact. This is a biblical fact. Back to Malachi. It says that there may be me in my house and prove me what we said the Lord of hosts. If I would not open the windows of heaven, this is where we get it confused, and pour out a window blessing that there should not be enough room for you to receive it. Here it is. And I will rebuke the devourer for your namesake. Wait a minute. Now, preachers teach this and say, if you don't pay your tithes, you are cursed with the curse. And they say you're robbing God if you don't pay 10%. Well, I say this. If you say I'm robbing God on 10%, then you're robbing him on the other 13%. Because tithes and offering was around the 23.3 percentile. Do you understand when you read from Exodus to Leviticus to Deuteronomy, that there were over 12 to 14 different tithes within a seven year period. How do I know it's more than 10%? Well, for one, the tithes was first given to the Levites. It was to the Levites, as I've been saying. It's to the Levites, as Malachi been saying. Did you know there was a tithe for the celebration of what God had did? There was also a tithe for that. There was also a tithe for the widows and the orphans. Uh-oh. And every third year, there was a tithe to the poor. So that averaged around 23% during the course of that year. And every third year, you gave to the poor. And you even gave some to the strangers staying in the land with you. Mm, I don't have time to go through all of it now, but if you go and read, matter of fact, let me do this. Let me do this. For the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to post all these scriptures right here in the text. All right? So you can fact check me with the Bible. Here we go. I'm posting it right now. So just, just in case, just in case somebody say I'm lying, here it is. Listen, right here. Go back and look at the comments. Copy and paste it. You can go to Leviticus 27 and 30, Numbers 18 and 27, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 to 20. Let me talk right. 22 through 24, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 12, 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 5, Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 37 and 38, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 5, and we're in the book of Malachi right now, chapter 3, verse 8 through on 12. And then, what about Jesus? So I dealt with Abraham. We can't take a one isolated event to make it a doctrinal teaching because Abraham only paid tithes one time. 
one, and it was from the war. But didn't Jesus talk about tithes, sir? Somebody put up Matthew 23, verse 23, then, since y'all checking me. Put it up. Let's go to Matthew 23. Please, please look at all those scriptures, screenshot it, so you can go back and look over, and it's going to tell you where all the tithes, which was not money, it was produce of the land, as I've been saying, and who it was given it to, and who, what culture was it from. Okay? Look at all them scriptures. Now we're going to Matthew 23. What about Jesus? Didn't Jesus teach on tithes? Jesus didn't really teach on tithes. He made mention of tithes. And look what he made mention of. Let's go. Matthew 23. Now, at the beginning of this, it says Jesus criticizes the religious leaders. Jesus is rebuking the religious leaders for not teaching, but for living a false life. In other words, he said, do what they say, but don't do what they do. In other words, they were teaching the right things, but they were not living the right things. This is why James chapter one, verse 22 says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. So you can't just teach the word and not do it. Otherwise you're self-deceived and you're a hypocrite. Hello. So going down to verse 23, it says this. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, you Pharisees and hypocrites. I just said hypocrites, didn't I? Yes. He says, for you are careful, here it is, to tithe even the tiniest income. Here it is. Income of what? Income from your herb, gardens. But you ignore the important aspects of the law, which is justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, because remember, Christ had not died yet. Amen. So the law was not fulfilled because the blood was not shed. So they were still implementing tithes at that time. And it was still produce because Jesus just addressed it here. He said, you tithe of your herbs and gardens. But you but you neglect the more important things. Then he calls them blind guys. Matter of fact, let me change it to the King James version. Some people like the King James, the King James. OK, it says, woe unto you, you scribes, Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay a tenth of mint, anise and cumin, sugar and all of this stuff. What is Jesus talking about? Jesus is simply talking about, as I mentioned earlier, the produce of the land. Notice he didn't even mention money in this passage. When he dealt with the tithe, he dealt with the produce of the land. And you better believe that Jesus didn't have money in that time because Judas, one of his, the 12 disciples who betrayed him, was the money treasurer. That's a fact, Jack. Um, also, Jesus told his disciples to search out and cast a net, and they found a coin in a fish's mouth. Do you remember that? That was money. But when he dealt with the tithe, we know they had money. That's why I mentioned it. It didn't say nothing about money. It said you tithe a mint of mint and this and cumin. These are herb spices, produce of the land. Remember I said earlier that ties was food and animals, things you can eat, okay? That's what the tithe was. And so even when Jesus is dealing with this perspective, he didn't say nothing about money. And this is where he talks about the tithe. Okay, so what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this, if you try to put me back in bondage of the law of 10%, and, and actually, remember I said earlier, it was around 23%, so you're not even keeping the tithe all correctly because it was 23%, right? If But if you put me in the bondage of 10%, right, again, if I'm held by that law, then the blood that Jesus shed has no effect, I'm going to let that ponder for a minute. I'm going to let it ponder. What you say, bro? It says, she was not judged by the law, but by grace. That's right. And here's why I said the statement that I just made. If you put me back on the law, pastor, preacher of 10%, then you put me back under the curse of 10%. Somebody please in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. 
That's right. Tree life saved this poor widow has put in more. That's right. Luke chapter 21. Somebody please put in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. I'm going to show you why we can't keep the law and we're not under the law. Let me let me say this while somebody's getting ready to put this in the comments. Romans chapter 6 verse 14 it says this, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Well, Galatians 3 and 10, here it is. It says, for as many as of the works of the law are under a curse. There it is. I'm, I'm going to put this up. It says, for all who rely, here it is, breathe this for yourself so people won't say I'm making it up. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Wait a minute. Verse 11 says this, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. So we're living by faith and under grace of what Christ has done. Because in Matthew 15, you can put this up if you want to, but I'll recite it. It says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Why? Because we couldn't do the law was not given to us as people who live today. It was given, as I said earlier, to the Jews, to the Hebrews, to the Israelites. OK, that's not enough for you. So Christ, right, is the fulfillment of the law, right? But do you know what else Christ did with the law? Oh, I got to show you this one. Let me let me put this in the comments. Let me put this in the comments. Because because somebody don't believe. Let me put this in the comments. And I see your comment, whoever that is, and I'm addressed that in a minute. Let me let me put this up. It is. For Christ is not only the fulfillment of the law, but read, it says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe it. Do y'all see that? Christ is not only the fulfillment of the law, but he's the end of it. Uh-oh, that's the alley-oop. I see you. I see you, brother Adrian. I see you. Listen. Christ is the end of the law. So as I just read in Galatians chapter three, it says that if you put me back under the law, that voids out what Christ did. And then you put me back under the curse of the law. So now let's get real. We keep the law of 10%, right? Let's get real. Are y'all still with me? We keep the law of 10%. So if you keep the law, the curse of the law of 10%, then you also need to keep the law of not eating pork. But I don't see no none of you all giving up your ham or bacon sandwiches. Uh oh. Oh, I didn't. I didn't hit them in the house. Now, listen. I say everything out of love. If you keep the law of ten percent, which was not money, so you should be giving wheat, barley, and sacrificing cattle and sheep, right? But if you say even if it was money, which it was not, we clearly just dissected that on the scriptures we went over, right? But if you say, keep the law of 10%, you're robbing God, then stop eating pork. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7, it says, don't even eat the swine. Wait a minute. How about you tell your wives to leave the camp or the church when she's on her? Did you know that was a part of the law? If your wife was on her menstrual cycle, if she was on her period, she had to go outside the camp for seven days because she was considered to be unclean and she could not sit on anything. What about for women or preachers that are supposed to baptize people? This is why she was supposed to be outside the camp, right? Because she would have contaminated the people with her blood. But I don't see nobody putting their wives or the first lady out the church. You ain't going to do that because you might not have a home to sleep at. Uh oh, <laughs> what am I saying? James chapter 2, verse 10 says, 
for whosoever should keep the whole law and offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So you can't tell me you keep the law of tithes, but you don't keep the law of not eating pork. You don't keep the law of menstrual cycles. You don't keep the law of ceremonial unclean diseases. You don't keep the law of mixing silk versus cotton. You don't keep the law of eating unleavened bread. I feel like preaching. You don't keep the law of rendering evil or what should we say now for I-242? Or how about being stoned when adultery was committed? And there has been a lot of admitted over the churches that we have loved on people with grace, but we didn't stone them. Do you understand that when you were uh, uh, caught in the act of adultery, you read this in John 8, when they tried to question Jesus, the woman who was caught up in adultery, and he said, he who without sin, what, cast the first stone? And they all dropped their rocks because they all had sin. And so according to the law of the Old Testament, if you found someone in the church caught in adultery village, the whole church was to stand around in circles, you in the middle and stone you and the adulterer to death. So imagine taking these big boulders and rock and blasting you on, on in your town and knocking you down into the rocks creates a crater in your head and the blood is coming out and the pus and the dents and the broken bones until you are dead. But why we're not doing that? Because clearly there have been a lot of people that committed adultery. See, you can't pick and choose what law you want to keep. That's why you can't keep it. Because Christ fulfilled the law and he's the end of the law. So we're under grace now. And people try to use this, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, where Paul is dealing with Mosul, not the ox that treaded the corn. You can read this in, in also Galatians chapter 6, from I saw that should also read. It's talking about giving honor to religious leaders who teach and live and preach off the gospel. Matter of fact, you can put this up here, 1 Timothy chapter 5, around verse 17. It talks about the elder, let the elders be counted worthy of double reward. So what am I saying? If you want to give 10%, cool. If you want to give 20%, cool. I'm not against it. However, it is not a mandate for you to give 10% and you are not held under that law. Listen, pastors need to tell us the truth because I'm not held under that law. The Apostle Paul, who wrote a third of the New Testament, didn't even speak on tithes. Pastors tried to use 1 Corinthians 9. They tried to use 1 Timothy chapter 5, but it had nothing to do with tithes. Well, what about Ananias and, and, and Sapphira? What about the two that lied to the Holy Ghost preacher? Chapter 5. If you read that passage, Acts chapter 5, verse 1 on down to like the 14, 15 verse, You'll read that Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira, however you say her name, they had sold their homes. And Peter was telling them, listen, it was to your discretion to sell your home. You could have kept your money and you could have uh, kept your home. You didn't have to sell it. But what they they did was they lied to Peter, but they didn't lie to him. They lied to the Holy Ghost. Matter of fact, let me read it. Put this in the comments. Put this in the comments, man. I I, I got to roll. I got to roll with it. And I'm probably going to do a part two. But let's go to Acts chapter five. Here it is. It says, I'll read it. A certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price has been privy to it and they bought a certain part and laid it at the apostles feet but peter and ananias said why has satan filled your heart why did you lie to the holy ghost and kept back part of it the price of the land while it was remained was it not your own as i just said earlier peter was saying listen it was your own to keep and and whatever you sold it was your own it was in your own power to keep and he said, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. He dropped dead, not because of the money of tithes, which 
I went over that because it didn't mention anything about ties. Again, pastors will use this to implement ties, but this had nothing to do with ties. This had to do with them lying to Peter and the Holy Ghost that was in Peter and they dropped dead. So you can't use Acts chapter 5 and Ananias and Sapphira to support ties of money. You can't because it didn't say nothing about ties. You can't use 1 Corinthians because Paul was dealing with help aiding the leaders. It talks about a prophet being worth his reward. Matter of fact, that because you think I'm lying. You think I'm lying and I'm going to eat it up with salt and pepper. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Listen, it says this. It says, let the elders, this is leaders now, rule well, counted worthy of double honor. Remember I said that earlier. A prophet is worth his reward and he's worth double. And here it is, verse 18. For the scripture said, muzzit not the ox that treaded the corn. The labor is worth his reward. Now let me change that to the NLT because it's going to give you a tab. You got to look for the tabs now, right? It says this. Those who work deserve, well, when you hit the tab, I don't know if y'all can see that. It's kind of, let, let me let me change that and see if y'all can see that. Okay. It's probably, you probably can't see that, but there's a tab here. Let me, let me see if I can share that. I don't know who that person is. It just popped up, but look, let me hit that there. You see that? There's a tab and the tab talks about Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, that talks about muzzle not the ox that traded the corn. And in Luke 10, somebody go to Luke. And I'm, I'm about to wrap up because I'm going to have to do a part two to this because this is too lengthy. Luke 10. All right, Luke 10. And we're going to go to verse 7. Now, Luke is dealing with when Jesus has sent out, right? Jesus sends out his disciples and he 72 other disciples that he sent out and told them to take your weapons with you and he said go into the towns preach the gospel don't take any money listen he says don't take any money nor a traveler's bag with you don't even take an extra pair of sandals he says and don't stop to greet anyone on the road he said whenever you enter someone's home first say may god's peace be on this house if those who live there are peaceful, peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing will return unto you. Verse 7, it's key right here. It says this. It says, don't move from home to home. Stay in one place eating and drinking what they provide. Wait a minute. What was the tab that referenced us here? The tab was in 1 Timothy chapter 5, right? Around the 17th verse. It gave us a reference, reference to look back at Luke 10. Well, Luke 10, it says this. Don't move from home to home. Stay in one place, drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve their pay. This had nothing to do with tithes. This had everything to do with God making provision for him sending out the 72 elders. Notice it didn't mention anything about tithes in the text. In other words, God was saying that I'm going to send you out and I'm going to make provision for you by food, drink, and shelter. But pastors and preachers will try to use this to talk about tithes. And again, Luke 10 and 7, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Timothy 5 had nothing to do, even Acts chapter 5, which I just mentioned, Ananias and Sapphira, had nothing to do with tithes and offerings. So do we support the church? Yes, you should. I'm telling you, we should always be growing in our worship. We should always be growing in our prayer life. We should always be growing in our giving. That's financially and food, shelter, clothing, you name it, whatever God puts in your heart. And here's the key thing. Paul didn't even preach on tithes and offerings. You cannot find one chapter and verse in the New Testament that says it is a mandate for me to pay tithes today. You can't find one scripture. Paul, who wrote a third of the New Testament, right? If it was that important, why didn't Paul teach on it? He taught on money. He taught on giving as the scriptures we just went over. But you cannot take that and say he was talking about tithes. He wasn't. And why? I'm about to close this out. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. 
please. I want chapters, chapter nine, verse six and seven. Can somebody put in the comments? I'll go to it. Here's why. Here's, here's why we give. And this is why I'm not dismantling or disregarding. If you want to give 10%, that's fine. And here's why I'm saying this. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse six and seven. So offerings is what needed in our church community. That's right, Kiana. Offerings is what's needed. And here's why. Not what I'm saying. I'm going to put what the Apostle Paul said. Let me put this in here. As a matter of fact, I want the NLT version because I want to make it plain. Right? Here it goes. Let, let, me, let me paste this in the comments. Here it is. Here it is. Pop up. Pop up. Pop up for your brother one time. Here it is. This is why I encourage giving. It says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Now, he's talking about farmers. In, in other words, if you give little, you will reap little. If you give much, you will reap much. So I encourage giving. Give to a Bible teaching church home. Give to preachers and pastors who are preaching the truth. As we just read in 1 Timothy, a prophet, an elder, a pastor, a bishop is worth his reward. He's worth it. Pay him. They're worthy of it. If they're doing right, you should want to give. And here's how I know. Let's go to verse 7. This is key right here. This is key. If y'all don't get nothing else tonight, please get this because verse seven is the key. It says this. I'm going to put this up in the comments. My sister Jennifer's online. Thank you. It says this. You must each. Here it is. Uh-oh. This is the key. This is the key. <laughs> Listen, the key. It says you must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Uh-oh. Did you see that? Can somebody please contest that I not make this up? Can somebody please contest that the scripture had said the, 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 the scripture had said each person must decide to give in response and as he is purpose in his own heart, in the King James Version, it'll say, give according as your purpose in your own heart. Notice, I didn't make this up. This is scripture, y'all. So for anybody who try to call me a, her a heresy or a false teacher, look at what your scripture says. It says, each person must decide what they may give in their heart. It said, not in response to pressure. So let me deal with that. Nobody should be pressuring you to saying, you don't pay your tithes, you curse. That's a lie. That's Old Testament. It was to Levi. says, not to me, sir. You're incorrect. Whether you know or you don't know, you're teaching a false doctrine because that's not what the scripture says. I'm not going to be intimidated or manipulated or feared by you because of your opinion when the word says this. We don't give out of fear, y'all. And why are we not telling people the truth? Because here's the deal. A few pastors are scared to tell people about this because they think that the people will stop giving. We got lights that we need to pay, gas and water to run. We got these things we need to take care of. Well, if people leave your ministry or your church and your church closes and your church folds, then it wasn't built by God. Uh-oh. Psalms 127 verse 1 says this, except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchmen walk it but in vain. So is your ministry built off people or is it built off God? Because it doesn't matter who leaves your organization. It doesn't matter who leaves your church. If God establish your organization, your platform, it will thrive. It will grow. It will increase. It will transform courage. It will uplift. It will deliver the souls of those coming in.
because God is doing it. So you don't worry about people take care of your support, your ministry, when God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter four, verse 19. So I ask again, if we tell people the truth, they may want to give more than 10%. See, if I stay here, I'm stuck here. But if I grow in my giving, right? And I, and I give more than 10% now because I understand the concept. I give more. I believe in giving. Giving, the principle of giving works. You say, what, what tithing works? No, it was the principle of the giving because God is judging the heart. First Samuel 16 and 7. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So God ain't judging necessarily the, the principle of the 10%. He's judging the heart on why you gave. Because if you gave the 10% and you got an attitude, you could have kept it. Uh-oh, I'm in the house. God don't want your 10% and you got an attitude or you're not happy with giving. Remember the scripture, as we just read, says God loves a cheerful giver. So if you're giving it out of anguish, if you give giving it out of pressure, you're better off keeping it. Because God don't want that because your heart ain't pure. Well, I'm in the house tonight. So we are not mandated to keep the ties because it wasn't about money, but we are encouraged and prompt to give and we should support. Here's, here's why, because we don't have a problem with spending a hundred dollar ticket on a baseball game or two hundred dollars to get our hair done, to go to a concert, to support these secular artists. But we have a problem and an issue with coming in the church and blessing those who are transforming lives. Our priorities are messed up. See, if you listen to what I'm saying, I'm not saying don't give. I'm saying don't be pressured or locked into a law that has passed away to give. Because we're giving by grace now and we should be growing in our giving. So support, love the church, love the people, constantly grow. We need to grow from 10% to maybe 30%. But of course, to your heart and what you can for because you can't tell me now and i'm about to close out but you can't tell me if god is god of order right first corinthians 14 verse 40 it says let all things be done decently and in order and i believe in matthew chapter 10 verse 16 through 18 it says the gates of hell should not prevail against god's church you are ridiculing me right saying you got to pay your tithes and i've even had a few pastors over the years right all through the years of 20 years of ministry, I've been in different churches where some even stretch far to say that if you don't tithe, you're going to hell. That's demonic, y'all. That's not the Bible. So you mean to tell me that God wants me to give my last $10 to the church and my wife and kids need bread? That's out of order. Can I prove it? I'm going to the Bible. First Timothy, I believe, 3 and 5, it says, for if put this in the comments so so we can show the people I'm not lying. I, I gotta go here. First Timothy three and five it says this. Oh, uh, I, I can hear I can hear the money men coming after me now. They finna get me. I'm in trouble. It says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? How can I give the church six baskets of food and I can't even afford to feed my wife bread? That's out of order. I can't give these people that and I don't even have crackers in the cabinet. Because I'm not married to the church. I'm married to my wife. God, my wife, children, then the church in that order. Remember, your first ministry is your home. And then when you can start, give where you give and then try to in, in, increase in giving more. But if I give to the church and I haven't taken care of my wife and kids, I will be out of order. Y'all mad at me, but I just gave you what the scripture said. And so a few times I gave, I, I gave out of ignorance. And then they have these $100 lines. Has anybody ever been in a $100 lines? Stand in a $100 seed line. And, and let me clear this up. When the Bible refers to seed, it's two types of seeds. It's seeds and herbs of the earth, the produce, and the seed of the word of God. We say sow a seed for your need. That's not, where, where's the chapter and verse for that? 
when Paul was talking about the farmers, he was making an illustration. OK, he was talking about giving. But we use this concept to say that 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 so a seed, so a seed is actually offering because the seeds of the Bible refers to the herbs, the fruits and vegetation. Right. And the seed of the word of God in Mark chapter four, verse one through 20, when the word was sown on four types of ground, there's four hearts. It was talking about the seed of the word of God. And that's right. We treat the church like an auction. So we have these hundred dollar lines and they go, well, we'll give a hundred dollars. The Lord's telling me give a hundred dollars. How did the Lord that I had a hundred dollars and I only got 20 in my pocket? Somebody lying. So, so you want me to stand in this auction and we say 105, you can't give 100, give, 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 give 75, 75, 85, 85, 95, say, they did, but they did, but they did, but they sold to the sucker in the blue hat. You've been had, you've been hoodwinked. You cannot name one chapter in the Bible where it ever told you to stand in the auction line for a hundred dollar seed. You, please, please, somebody show me the words that in, in the book. And so what am I saying? We got to tell people the truth, y'all. We're not supposed to be reaching people with fear, with intimidation, with manipulation, with dictatorship, and forcing them to pay things that they might not even have. Because we give, as the scripture says, according to our heart, we give by grace. And where grace abound, love does that much more. So we should be giving more. I'm encouraging to give more. But I'm not mandating and holding you to the law because now if I have to keep this one law of the 613, the law of tithes, then I have to keep the other 612. And I can't keep them because I don't have a sheep and oxen. I don't have an ephod. I don't have the uh, priest garments. We're not sacrificing sheep and cattle and pigeon and turtle doves or taking the blood from the slaughterings of the lambs and putting it on earlobe. Or our right big toe. That was a part of the law too. So we got to stop picking and choosing laws that only benefit us. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 6 and 10, for the love of money is the root to all evil. When I talked about the Catholic Church pushing this stuff, this is where the stuff comes from. And so if we're honest with the people, if we tell the people the truth, right? If we teach in love, people will support your church. I just talked to a gentleman today. They don't give the tithe. They give offering. And their church is sustainable. Their church is flourishing. I used to go to a kingdom hall as a little boy around six, seven years old. And guess what? They didn't pass around a collection plate. They had a box. My mama can contest this. In the back of the sanctuary. They had a box, an envelope where you could drop money off or an envelope to support their ministry. And guess what, y'all? This kingdom hall has glass stained chandeliers. They have glass windows and doors and they have a monitoring system and they have uh, uh, televisions and they have speakers and they have and they have these nice suits on. And they're flourishing because the people want to give because they're teaching doctrine. People will pay for the truth. You don't have to force them. Because if God is elevating your place, he will send them. If he gives you the vision, he will make provision. That's why he says in the book of Habakkuk 2 and 2, write down a vision and make it plain. Well, listen, my time is up. I'm, I'm nine minutes over. I got to go. There's so much more I want to say. But is Creflo Dollar wrong? Yes and no. He was wrong about saying that tithes was not biblical. Tithes is biblical. It tithes was biblical in the Old Testament. And that 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 tithe kept being fulfilled until Jesus shed the blood. And after Jesus had shed the blood and had redeemed us from, from the life of sin and damnation, right? That's what the blood does. It brought back in reconciliation with the Father. So now... Paul comes on the scene teaching grace. I told you Romans 6 and 14. Now we're under grace now. I'm not held by the law because as I said earlier, Romans 10 verse 4, that Christ is the end of the law. Only to 10% when really it was 23% anyway and it was not money. Well, I might be stoned. It might put me on a stake. But I'm willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. Acts 5 and 29 says, 
Peter says that we ought to obey God rather than man. And listen, if you're mad at me, take it up with God because I didn't write the word. I just simply repeated what the word said in context. If you go back and look, please watch the video again. If you go back and look at what I said, I said what the scripture said. We're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. And if we're, then we should be encouraged to give a little more than 10%. Don't limit God. Put him in a box because he may want to do more. So I'm encouraging give to your churches. Give to your leaders. Give to your pastors. They're, they're teaching true. Have an honest heart. Clean hands and pure heart. Right? Give to them. Right? As 2 Corinthians 9 and 7 says, don't give by pressure. Don't give by grudgingly or necessity. God loves you cheerful giver and we got it what the scripture says listen i don't care what people say how they feel what things they might may try to bring against you we stand on the word of god and the bible says preach the word in season out of season when they want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it it says preach the truth and in john 8 32 it says and you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free so I hope somebody has been free that you're not in that bondage, but that you give by grace. But I encourage you to give more. Amen. Tithes is not a mandate for today. And tithes, as we discovered in the Old Testament, was not money. It was produce and animals of the land. OK. I, I, I hope I made it plain as possible. That's right. A closed mind don't gain wisdom. Bible says in Proverbs that a man will increase in learning and understanding. And so I hope you all have been blessed. Please go back and watch this video. Uh, don't take it over me. You can if you want to, but I'm going to come back with more doctrine. This is part one. Part two, I'll come back because there's more to say. But don't be deceived. And this is why we should study for ourselves. Take everything that I'm saying with the scriptures I put up and check me. If I said anything out of context or out of error, I'll eat it with salt and paper. I will humble myself and say, I did it wrong. But if you look at the context of what I taught, that's Bible. That's why I'm giving you the scriptures. Don't take my word for it. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15. And I'm closing out. Listen, Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, thank you for tonight. I thank you, Lord, that your word will reign. That your word will go out and accomplish that which you please. Just as Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, it will not return to you void. But it will accomplish in the things where to you sent it. God, we can only be transformed by your word. Your word says that the words that you speak, John 6 and 63, they are spirit in their life. And it is only by the word of God that we're transformed. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, God. So, Lord, we don't care about the likes. We don't care about the accolades or the recognition. But we only word. Because you said heaven and earth should pass away, but my words should not pass away. You alone will only be glorified, God. And for those of us who are ministers or teachers, we have to get back to teaching this thing correctly, God. Not by what we feel, not by being taught, but only by the word of God can we be free. And so, Lord, I pray that people who have watched this video, who have tuned in, and people who will watch this video, God, that they understand what was represented here tonight, God. That we're under grace, God. And where grace may abound, God. Love increases that much more. So help in our giving. Help us to grow in our love. Help us to grow in our forgiveness. Help us to grow in our worship. Help us to grow in our understanding and our wisdom and our knowledge. And most of all, our obedience. Because you said obedience is better than sacrifice. And so, Lord, if we didn't get nothing else here tonight, let us study for ourselves. 
and speak to us according to your word, that you alone may be glorified. And Lord, if people see my heart tonight, I'm only encouraging your people, your viewers, your listeners to come after you even the more. And Lord, I'm willing to take anything that comes with it. But Lord, for you, I live for the rest of my life. And I pray for those who are on this line, that you touch their hearts, that you help them in their families, that you touch these marriages, that you touch these singles, and that you touch our babies and keep us in these last and evil days. And I pray us up tomorrow with our hearts and our minds fixated on you. We speak peace and blessings in our life, all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And so I thank you for tuning in with me. Thank you for being this long with me. I love you guys. I appreciate the support. And it's not about me being right, but it's about what's right. For those who believe, for those who are teaching the doctrine, God's word is true, not our opinions, not our feelings, and not our titles. God's word will remain, and we have to teach that. So before you go to bed at night, while you're praying for one another, pray for Creflo Dollar. Pray for the other pastors. Pray for the other people that we can wake up and teach this thing and get it correct. Because we all have to stand before the great king and give an account. And judgment first starts in the house. First Peter chapter four, around the 17th verse. God is judging the houses. It started way before the pandemic. And now other things are being exposed. This is going to determine who's walking with God and who's going to continue to keep going with God. This right here is going to determine who's a real soldier and who's not. So keep looking at who's the author and finish of our faith. I love you guys. Pray for me. And time with another hot topic with Kentra Lee, a man of thunder. God bless you and good night.